Okay, a couple important words. What we just saw there was something called centrifugal force. What does centrifugal mean? Do you know? Circular. It's centrifugal means. center fleeing. Okay. So, have you ever been in a ride like that? Yeah. Have you raised your hand if you've actually been in that ride? Oh, oh man, this is not the exact thing. Not that exact thing. But, it, but something very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you have experienced firsthand pretty high Ooh. centrifugal force, right? Okay. Well, let's, let's do a little demonstration of centrifugal force. Glass of water is good, yeah. Or a bucket of water. I'll bring a bucket tomorrow. Hey, there's a uh, Bill Nye video where you do that. Yeah. Yeah, so you can do this at home. It's not, I mean, Bill Nye. Try, try this at home. Get a bucket, big bucket of water. Swing it over here. Yeah, and, and if you just you start swinging it around in a circle, eventually you can just do this with it, and none of the water comes out. Yeah, that's right. what I do. That's my grocery store. Nice. Nice. Okay, get up where you can see this. This is actually, come over here. Oh. Yeah. This is a good spot to try a little border. You just push your ankles. No. It's actually my bag. Okay, get up here where you can see on. this. So here's a good example. If I spin this thing around, that marble is experiencing centrifugal force, right? It's pushing it up against the edge of the circle. So if I let this thing go, it's going to go flying out, isn't it? Wrong. Goes tangentially. You guys knew that actually, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't go flying out. Look, if I let it go, it's right about this way. Right about right there. It goes off tangentially. If I try to release it, it's right here. Watch what it does. Right? Okay, so there is exhibit C. There's something fishy going on here because as soon as I remove this thing, it just travels in a straight line. Right? So there must not have been any real force acting on this thing. Right? Outward. Okay. Okay, yeah, you guys are you're, you guys are pretty sharp. And so centrifugal force, is it real? It sure feels real, doesn't it? If, if you're in that if you're in the ride Man, that feels real, doesn't it? That centrifugal force, you can feel the pressure on your back, okay? Yeah. If you're in a car and you go driving around a corner and you're in a in a truck with a vinyl bench seat that's just been armor all up mm -hmm. and you're wearing it's real slippery. 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 If if you're wearing like slacks and you're sitting in the middle and they go somebody goes around a corner real quick, you're gonna go flying into the outside door, right? Because of that centrifugal force. Agreed? Okay, well, it's not real. It's false. Let's prove that it's false. Somebody, in order for centrifugal force to be real, what do we know about forces? Let's go back to Newton's laws. What's Newton's third law? Forces work in pairs. Yeah. Forces work in pairs, right? Forces, a uh, uh, force is shared between, always is shared between two objects, right? It's never, never by itself. There's always force is shared by two objects, right? There's, we could label an action force and a reaction force as being different things, but they're really just the same thing, right? Let's warm up a little bit with our action reaction stuff, our Newton's our third law. So what's the force acting I let this thing go, what's the force acting on the Purell? Gravity. Okay, gravity's acting on the Purell, but it's also acting on something else then because forces have to act. The Earth. The Earth, right? There's a force between the Earth and the Purell, right? Problem solved. If I set this thing on the desk, what are the forces acting on the bottle now? The table on the bottle. Okay, the table's pushing up, right? Mm -hmm. Gravity's pushing down. Are those action reaction pairs? Ah, oh, they're not. They're acting on you. I thought I could trick you. 
acting on different objects, aren't they? Right? There's two action-reaction pairs going on there. There's the normal force, which is bottle pushes on table, table pushes on bottle, right? And then there's another action-reaction pair, earth pulls on bottle, bottle pulls on earth, right? Okay, so how about for that example we just saw, the centripetal force? It's a force, right? So what are the, what is it acting between? What two objects? Okay, but the wall is pushing on you, not pulling on you, right? You're feeling an, you're feeling a force outward. What's pulling you outward? Do they have some mysterious gravitational ring outside that thing? That's it's, no, they don't. <laughs> I don't, they're not that sophisticated. So, do you, do you see my point? You can't define an action-reaction pair, so it is not a force. It's completely in your mind. There is no centripetal force. What's going on instead, Rylan already kind of said, what's going on instead, if we look at a bird's eye view, this is helpful. It's just your tangential force is acting outward, but you're retained either by a wall or if you're a string attached. Exactly, exactly. What's going on is technically it's not a centrifugal force that's acting. What's what is it instead? Tangential. Uh, tangential is, is the velocity is tangential, but where's in what direction is the force acting? Uh, centripetal. Centripetal. And what does centripetal mean? Kind of center seeking. So this guy here that's a false force, it's a fictitious force. This one is a real deal. It works. Okay. So let's look at a couple slides here that I think helps understand this. So is it the same thing but one's real? Yeah, one's one's real and one's fictitious. The okay, so if this car is driving along on this circular path, that's the direction of the velocity vector, right? Uh, but it's turning around the corner and so you feel this sensation of being forced to the outside of the car, right? But what's really happening? Well, let's take an example of this guy driving along in the car as he goes around this turn, and he's unfortunately got his coffee cup on the dashboard and his cell phone on the seat. Okay, as he goes around the corner, they're going to tend to slide to the outside, right? How come? Because of inertia. They want to keep going in the same straight path that they were going in. Yeah, Newton's first law, right? They're going to want to keep going in their straight line path, and as the car they don't move away from you, you move away from them in the car, right? The car moves away from them and they eventually, the car moves away so far that they run into the far side of the car, right? Anybody see that? Okay, so I got something for you here. We got uniform circular motion. Let's look at two points on the circle. So we've got an object that starts off at this initial initial spot right here and it's going to move around the circle to this point right here. So there's the initial position vector and the final position vector. We're going to measure those relative to the center of the circle, right? So does everybody agree that if I if I filled in if I made these into arrows there's the initial position relative to the origin and there's the final position. Okay? Agree? Okay, so what about the change in position? Well, then that becomes the change in position, doesn't it? Right? We're starting here and we're ending there. Right? Let's write that as a vector equation. Initial position plus change in position must equal final position and it works because how do we add up vectors? Tip to tail. Yeah. 
So the tip of vector R naught adds to the tail of delta R, and we end up with our final vector, okay? the resulting vector. Okay? All right, so let's look at the velocity vectors now. Okay, so would you agree then if we add the velocity vectors in, so we said here's our initial position, final position. We're moving around in a circle and the velocity, the velocity is tangential, right? If we, let pretend this is a string, if I clip the string right here, doesn't the object fly off tangentially with constant speed? We're in deep interstellar space, no gravity, right? Okay, only tension. If I clip it right here, it flies off in that direction. Okay, so here is our initial velocity vector, there's our final velocity vector. Now remember what we can do with vectors, right? If we want to superimpose vectors or add them up, we can always slide them around to reorient them. We just can't change the magnitude or the direction. Right? So I could take these two vectors and let's move them over here, keeping them oriented the same and keeping their magnitudes the same. So there they are, right? Okay. There's our initial velocity and our final velocity. And if I show the change in velocity, there it is, right? Everybody agree? Okay. All right, so what do you suppose is going to be true? How would the angle there compare to the angle there? Might be the same. They're the same, right? I can show the angles improved. So there's the measure of this angle, 29.6, 29.6. And I can even change this. Let me let me get rid of all my little drawings. And I, I can I can move this thing around, right? So my final position changes, and look, the angles change in unison, right? See that? Pretty tricky, huh? Okay, so I've got I've got this relationship between these two triangles. What kind of triangles are those? Like look at this one right here. What's what's the magnitude of my initial position compared to the magnitude of my final position? Same, they're the radius of a circle, right? So if both of these legs are identical, what kind of triangle is this? It's isosceles, isn't it? Okay, so if we know we know a couple things here, right? Let's let's go back to geometry for a second. If we know that those are congruent and we've got some angle theta, and this is the same angle theta. Okay, so then this is this tells us that the other two angles have to be the same. What do we know about these two triangles then? They're, they're similar. Yeah, they're similar triangles, aren't they? Right? Okay. All right, so we get, let's translate this vector. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Uh, oh, I know what I want to do. There it is. Okay, what if I move this vector? my delta V vector, I'm going to take this thing and slide it up to here. So here it is. There's delta V. What do you notice about the direction of that vector? Straight to the center. It's straight to the center of the circle. Right? How about that? Right? So the direction of the change in velocity, which is the direction of the acceleration, for uniform circular motion, now we've got to make sure the object is moving around the circle at constant speed. If it wasn't moving at constant speed, if there were some tangential acceleration, well then there's going to be another component of the acceleration that's going to pull this thing away from the center. But if it's moving at constant speed, there's no tangential acceleration, right? The only acceleration is the centripetal acceleration that causes it to move in a circular arc, right? Everybody see that? Okay. So 
if that's the case, then when we look back at these pictures, they, they make more sense, right? What's really going on here is the car is moving away from the objects, right? What's providing this centripetal acceleration here? Right? But what's, what, what's, I guess I should say, what's providing this centripetal force? What about the car? The door. Yeah. Okay, the door's providing centripetal acceleration maybe on, on you, or your seatbelt is, okay? Is moving you towards the center of the circle. What's moving the car towards the center of the circle? The wheels. Okay, what about the wheels? So centripetal force, to keep in mind here, centripetal force, it, it, it's not a specific force, it's a category of force, right? It, it's it, it just something, there has to be a specific force that provides this centripetal force to make it go in a circle. Friction, sure, because what if the car drove along a real icy patch? Then it couldn't go in the circle, and there wouldn't be any centripetal acceleration, right? See what I'm saying? So it's the friction with the tires that's providing the centripetal force that makes it go in a circle. What if I swing a rock around on a string? What's providing the centripetal force there? If I swing it on a string, well, not my arm necessarily. Tension. Yeah, the tension in the string is always pulling it towards the center of the circle, right? If a satellite is orbiting around the Earth, What's providing the centripetal acceleration? Make it go in a circular orbit. Gravity. Gravity. Okay, so centripetal acceleration is just a flavor of, it's a category of acceleration, but it's got to be provided by some specific force, right? There's some specific agent of the centripetal force, always. Okay, in this case, the wheels are causing the car to move towards the center of the circle. They provide the centripetal acceleration. That's translated to you by the friction of your derriere with the seat and your uh, and the seat belt, right? Maybe you're grabbing onto the wheel too. But these objects right here don't have enough, there isn't a strong enough agent of the centripetal force to make them go in the same circle, right? Because it, it's too slippery. The friction isn't enough to make them travel along in that circle with the car, right? Okay. Uh, so let's just talk. We'll get more specific in a second, but let's just talk conceptually here. So there are problems as we sort of enter, you know, there actually are people starting to talk about eventually, like in your lifetimes, maybe even in mine, if I'm lucky, taking man flights to Mars. Okay. There are some dangers associated with that. What are they? Let's talk, this is just an interesting topic, but there's some stuff that's going to relate to what we're talking about. people can't really breathe. Well, they can't breathe, but I mean, they're not going to fly through space. They're going to dive through space. They're going to be in a ship. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about how long it takes. There, there are some, there's some real problems that, like, for example, once you're out of the ionosphere of the Earth, then you're subject to all kinds of high, high energy particles coming from the sun, the solar wind. And that's a problem. We've got to be able to shield the craft really well. You've got to be able to guard against, you're right, right. So you've got to be able to line it with something that's going to, shield that's going to be lightweight, can't use lead, that's going to shield the occupants from all those harmful cosmic rays in the solar wind, you got to be able to shield them from the really high energy rays that come from out of our solar system. And then you got to worry about little, like little tiny, when you, when you start entering close to a planet, you got to worry about little tiny objects, you know, that could, if, if a little, something that, with the mass of a grain of dust, was coming at the ship with a speed of 36,000 miles an hour, let's say, that's pretty high speed, right? Even something tiny like that carries a lot of energy, which we'll talk about soon. So there's all that stuff. But assuming we can engineer out all of that stuff, there's another problem. Yeah, that's a long space flight. What happens to people if they are not subject to any external forces? Their bones get weak. Right? Bones, bones grow in response to shear forces, right? Compressional forces too, but largely shear forces. And that's why uh, if you 
like if you are bedridden for a long time, you will lose your bones atrophy because they don't, there's no stimulant to the bone to produce these new osteocytes and grow stronger. If people that are, have really low bone density, uh, they, there's you know, drugs you can take to increase calcium absorption and things like that. But also one of the things that's been proven to be the most beneficial like for elderly people is to do just very low jumps off of a, off of a step, you know, depth jumps. They could be four inches, it doesn't matter. Just putting those momentary high forces on your bones stimulates them to grow new bone, right? So, but the problem with that is in the absence of any of these forces, your body's, your body doesn't, it, it, it gets really weak. Your bones get really weak, your muscles atrophy. That's a problem. So what, what do astronauts do now that are, for example, like on the space station? They, well, one thing they, I mean, they, they strap them to they, exercise. They strap them to exercise tables and they have to do like pretty hard exercise for, you know, at least an hour a day to try to compensate for the lack of force, right? But they still lose body mass. They still lose bone mass. What could you do instead? Okay. If you wanted to, if you really wanted to, uh, to prevent this kind of, of uh, physiological degradation and atrophy, you could put somebody in a large circle that's spinning around the center. Just like the Martian. Yeah, like Just like what? Uh, like the Martian. 2001 space. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them do. And, and a lot of times, what, what do the spaceships look like? I mean, if you... You, yeah, they look like a like a like a tire on a bicycle kind of, right? I mean, it would just essentially be. That's how it is. You ride a bike. They're smarter than me, though. So essentially, what you got is, I mean, I, this is this is like the top view looking down on the spaceship, right? There's the the living quarters are around the edge of this thing, right? And then you maybe got some little pathways in towards the center and some spokes that come out, you know, something like that, right? Okay, and it spins around, right? It spins around. And we're going to be able to calculate, like we could actually design one of these things, if not today, tomorrow, we'll be able to design one, we'll be able to figure out what the spin rate's going to be so we can simulate gravity, right? If you lived on a ship like this, what do you think's going to happen if you climb down one of these ladders towards the center? You'll get more new ways. You feel less and less of the force. And in the very center, there would be a little round spherical room where you could go where it would be truly zero G. Right? But as you move towards the outside, you get to presumably 1G is what you want. That's what we've evolved to like. I mean, that's what our body's like. But what if you really want to work out? Because you, you don't want to carry lots of weights on a spaceship. Weight is extremely expensive to get out of the Earth's gravitational well. Right? Yeah, maybe you'd build some workout rooms out here like this. They, go, they extend a little further out up these spires, and then out here there's a workout room. And what's going to happen out there? Do yoga. Yeah, you're going to get higher G's, right? And so even just doing own body weight, just body weight exercises would be hard to do. Your own body weight would provide the resistance to increase your, you know, work on developing muscle mass, right? Okay, but there's a practical consideration. In order for something like this to work, to not make you incessantly vomit, you can't spin too fast. After a while, if you're spinning too fast, that's going to tweak your inner ear, and you're going to be get sick. You're going to get motion sickness. It has to be pretty big. I, mean, I think it has to be something on the order of like 800 meters in radius. That's huge. How are you going to build something like that? You don't. You don't. Okay, but how could you make this still work then? Because we want to be able to send people. Let's see if you can use them. Think of something that might might work equally well. Magnets maybe work. Mag I mean, you could provide the force with a magnet, but you could even just use a simple cable. But what what's going to be? You can't afford to build something that big. 
needs to be much, much smaller. If Are we scrapping working. the idea of the spinning spaceship? We're, we're scrapping this idea of this great big bicycle tire because it's way too big. I mean, if, if this is 800 meters in radius, think about the amount of materials it's going to take to build that great big hoop. Just build separate rooms on this. On what? Like, just like the weight rooms. Ah. Why don't we instead, how about if we just do this? How about if we just say, okay, well, let's take a small piece of this and a small piece of that there, and let's just tether them together with cables, and we'll just start this thing spinning, right? Uh, and then you got it, don't you? Yeah. Right? So do those two communicate? Well, sure. Maybe these are tubes that they can go through. There you go. Yeah. Right. You, know, you, use huh. you use magnets to keep that. Could you distance. do that? Actually, like if you were to have it like a rolling pin where it's been like this and like that. Yeah. And you just like walked over. With the, like, no. You could. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, I, I did, eventually, if you know, looking in the distant future. I mean, this seems really far fetched right now, but if you, you know, we think on very short time scales. I mean, think about how much technology has evolved in the last 50 years. You know, I mean, a lot, right? So if you extrapolate into the future thousands of years, I mean, you know, it's hard for, and that's a short, geologically speaking, that is such a short period of time, right? I mean, that's not very much at all. I mean, if you look at, if you look at, at the lifespan of, of even modern humans on the planet, you don't have to go back to, you know, pivot, you know Australopithecines and things like that, you can go back to just stay Homo sapiens sapien. That goes back a long ways. I mean, before, well before recorded history, right? You're going back 100,000 years at least, right? With modern humans, then culturally modern humans. So, I mean, if you go 100,000 years in the future, just imagine what you're talking about now in terms of our ability to design on a different scale, you know, harvest materials from asteroids. Uh, small moons and develop like actually permanent living environments is eventually at this rate the planet's not going to last forever. Okay, I we're mean, assuming we don't kill ourselves first. Right. And assuming we don't start a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Start the yeah, this. But but even if we don't do that, I mean it's the you know the the rate at which the climate is changing right now is thousands of times faster than it's ever changed naturally. And so things are going to, you know, the planet's not going to last, unless we change things dramatically, we're going to kind of crap in our nest here. Uh, so we got to think about ways to eventually, you know, I mean, and what if, what if, you know, eventually, once every, there's a, what is it, a 1% chance every thousand year, I, can't, I don't remember what the time scale is on. But there's, I mean, there's a significant chance of a large bolide impact with the planet on large timescales. It's going to happen. There's no question about it. We're going to be impacted by a large bolide comet or meteorite at some point that's going to make the Earth uninhabitable. It's going to happen. And so, you know, if we want to preserve the species beyond the life cycle of our own planet, you know, things like this are going to become a reality, right? So you've got to think about how are you going to design stuff like this. And this is definitely what it's going to look like, without a doubt. This is what it's going to look like. You're going to live in a large enough, on the inside of a can, essentially, but it's going to be a large enough curvature so that it feels flat. Will we look like I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. How do they get here? All right, so let's take a look. <laughs> so if we go back then, let's, let's take a look at this. Last thing. So if, if we, based on the picture that we saw, right, based on this guy right here, would you agree that the ratio of, I think I need this ratio right there, yeah. If we look at the ratio of dr over r, the change in the position over the magnitude of, of the position, whether it's our initial position or our final position, it doesn't matter, it's the radius of a circle. The ratio of dr over, say, r naught is about 2 point, or 0.290. The ratio of dv over v is 
0.290. What do you know? We can show this geometrically. It's not that big a deal. But if I change, whoops, if I change this thing, that ratio stays the same, of course, right? Okay, so given that, if the ratio of delta R over R is equal to delta V over V, we can do some stuff with that. We can come up with some equations that are very helpful to us in trying to understand the centripetal acceleration stuff. So what if we, for example, divide each side through by delta T? Right? We're going to have some time interval, and the time interval can be understood as just the time it takes, wow. or is it the time it takes to go from there to there, right? Over which time the velocity changes from that vector to that vector, right? Make sense? Okay. So if we divide both sides by delta t, well, what is? Oops. What is? Well, then we can rewrite that as. 1 over r times delta r over delta t, and 1 over v times delta v over delta t. What is delta r over delta t? What does that sound like? Change of position over change in time. No, that's velocity, isn't it? Right? Chain, rate of change of position. Change in position over change in time is the same thing as velocity, right? Change in velocity over change in time is the same thing as acceleration, and this is uniform circular motion, so the only acceleration is centripetal acceleration, right? Okay, well, if we just multiply each side through by V, don't we get the simple result centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R, where V is the tangential speed, right? So there's one very useful way of calculating. Yes, sir? So would, uh, would the centripetal acceleration, would that be like the g-force then? It would. It would because what you would feel, even though you would, it would feel like gravity to you. Imagine that you, think about an ant on the inside of, a, of one of those balloon bicycle tires, right? If you spin it around, same concept. If the ant's standing on the outside, the ant is going to feel pressure against the outer wall just like I do right now. That's what you feel with gravity. You don't feel gravity. You don't feel gravity at all. What you feel is you feel the pressure of the normal force provides on the surface of the earth, right? You don't feel gravity. Gravity doesn't feel like this because mm, go, like jump out of off a diving board into a pool. What do you feel when you're in free fall? I mean, your stomach lurches, but why is your stomach, your stomach's lurching? Because all of a sudden you remove the pressure with the ground, right? So that's what you feel as gravitational force, is the return force, right? The normal force of the ground. So you feel the same thing on the inner wall of this space station. It's pressing against you, and you feel that pressure, and so that acts, it, we could tune it so it feels exactly like the same pressure you feel from gravity, which is, would mean that the centripetal acceleration required to make you go in a circle is 1g. Yeah. But I don't think it would be much. No, it would be identical. It would be, it'd be no different. The, the one small difference would be if the space station weren't very big, is there would be a small tidal difference between your head and your feet. Like just imagine, I, I can prove that to you. Imagine, where's that picture I just had? Right there. So imagine that a person is really big. A person is this tall, so you're standing like that. Well, the centripetal acceleration required to make your feet go in the circle is different than the centripetal acceleration required to make your head go in the circle, huh. right? And so you'd feel a differential, sort of like a differential gravity effect, which would be not good. But if this is really large, I mean, if you're talking 800 meters or more, it's pretty small. Pretty small difference. Yeah. Um, if the Earth stopped spinning, would you feel more, slightly more gravity? Because, or is there, if, if, the, if, if you're on the equator and the Earth stops spinning and you're standing on a scale, your weight would increase ever so slightly. Yeah, it would. It would. And we, we'll, we'll break that down with a free body diagram soon. Uh, what does this tell us, though? We go back to this picture right here. 
What's the relationship here? How is the centripetal acceleration affected if you increase the speed at which you're traveling in a circle? It goes up. It goes up with the square of speed. So if I double my speed, what happens to the centripetal acceleration required to keep me going in a circle? Increases by four. Okay. Once again, cars are dangerous. People don't have a very good ability to, to predict what's going to happen. If I if I'm going through a fixed curve, if I increase my speed, the amount of friction required to keep me in the turn doesn't just go up linearly with my speed. It goes up with the square of the change in speed. That's See what I'm saying? Yeah, very grippy pack, the soft rubber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 